Hi, and welcome to today's workshop on the GLASS Open Science Challenge 2021, a pilot project on the applicability of registered reports in quantitative political science by Hannah Bucher and Axel Burger. Um, the Social Science Data Lab is an event series at the Mannheim Center for European Social Research that provides a platform for researchers to present tools and methods for the collection, management, and analysis of um, data in the social sciences. Our speakers today um, co-organized and co-edited the Glass Open Science Challenge um, together with Ann-Kathrin Stroppe. Um, about our speakers, Hannah Bucher is a PhD student in survey research at the University of Mannheim and a research associate at ESIS, Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences, where she works at the German Longitudinal Election Study Glass. Uh, and recently, she also joined the Chair of Social Data Science and Methodology here at the University of Mannheim. Um, and Axel Burger is a social psychologist with research focus on political psychology, um, and he works as a postdoctoral researcher at GESAS, also in the teams of, um, of the GLASS. Um, so this workshop today introduces the GLASS Open Science Challenge. This was an initiative to um, increase the adoption of replicable and transparent uh, research practices in political science um, in the context of the German federal election in uh, 2021. Um, a short disclaimer, we are recording uh, this live stream in active speaker mode. So audio from on-site and remote attendees will be recorded. Um, and if your video is on while asking a question online, um, your video will be recorded as well. Um, for those uh, of you joining online, you may ask your questions by raising your hand or posting your questions in the Zoom chat, which I will then read out for you. Um, and if you have any questions like during the talk, feel free also to, um, yeah, to ask them during the talk. Um, so you don't have to wait until the end. Okay, so Hannah and Axel, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, we are very happy to be here to present the Glaze Open Science Challenge and discuss it with you. Um, and we are going to start. Oh, the slides are. Um, we're going to start um, by saying a few words about the replication crisis in social sciences. Then we're going to present the Glaze Open Science Challenge. And then in the end, uh, we have some general dis discussion issues around um, registered reports, which we would find very interesting to discuss with you. So we would very much like to keep this very interactive. So um, feel free as we are talking, if you have comments or questions, raise your hand either here in the room or um, virtually. So we're going to try to address your issues directly uh, during the talk. So just raise your hand and give us a sign that you have a comment or a question. Um, yes, as you're um, aware, um, and for us, as, a, as um, it would be very interesting to, to know um, how many of you have prior experience with uh, pre-registration or writing a registered report. So maybe you can just lift your hand or, or um, also virtually give us a sign so that we can, can have an impression about how experienced you are with this format. Okay, so there are some people in the room that have plus experience. One plus one online, okay. So that's uh, already interesting to know. So for some of you, this is going to be um, a topic that, that you've at least certainly heard of before, but um, not uh, really worked with. So um, I hope that we that you can we can give you some experiences and, and hints about how to address uh, pre-registration and registered reports. So um, as you are probably aware of during the last one and two or two decades, there have been intense dis discussions in the social sciences, but also in other fields about the robustness of our findings and the reliability of our theories. So in 2005, there was a, a famous paper by Ioannidis where he made the bold claim that um, most published published research findings are not replicable. There have been large scale replication attempts uh, in different fields, for example, in psychology, where very established theories and textbook uh, examples of famous findings were tried um, to, uh, to try to replicate these findings. And um, at least um, the share of findings that could be replicated in these replication attempts was lower than many researchers in the field would have expected. And in general, across uh, different disciplines, there's a substantive amount of researchers who would agree that there is a 
reproducibility problem in their field so that the findings are not as reliable as, as people would hope them to be and um, that something has to be done about this um, problem. Um, there are different potential causes of this replica, replication crisis or reproducibility crisis that have been discussed in the literature. So maybe the most important problem um, is publication bias. So normally, maybe you would expect if you have a study that is well planned and well conducted, then it should be worth of publication irrespective of whether the findings support the hypothesis or do not. But in reality, this is not how, how it ends up working. So um, there is um, empirical evidence showing that um, findings that support the hypothesis that was tested in this research are much more likely to be published than research where the um, results do not support the hypothesis. So um, in the end, while you would maybe expect um, scientists to be something like, like a detective who impartially tries to find truth, in the end, we, we end up finding ourselves often in a position that resembles more a lawyer who tries to advocate for a certain theoretical perspective or a certain theory and tries to support it. Um, and um, we have the problem that in the end, there is an incentive structure in the field where um, findings that support the hypothesis they test um, are published and findings that do not find support for the hypothesis that was tested end up in file drawers. So they are hidden from the scientific community and um, people are just not aware that uh, how often a certain hypothesis has been tested, how often people found support or did not find support. But this is a big problem for the field to have the, the, that many studies in, in the file drawer hidden from, from the community. Um, and another um, problem that is closely linked to, to publication bias are questionable research practices. So if you have such a high incentive to, to publish significant findings that support your hypothesis, then um, researchers are easily tempted to twist their data in a way that makes them support the hypothesis that they wanted to test. So um, one um, example of questionable research practices is so-called harking where you formulate your hypothesis after looking at the data. Yeah, so this is clear that this, this is not how it is supposed to work. So normally a hypothesis should be a prediction, not a postdiction. So in this case, um, you look at the data and then you pretend that what came out is exactly what you predicted before. Yeah. Or you have p-hacking. So if you have your data and you have a certain hypothesis, I mean, there are many degrees of freedom to researchers that they can use to twist their data to, in the end, find a, a result that significantly supports their hypothesis. But there are also um, other potential causes of the replication crisis. So in many cases, we have non-transparent operationalizations in research. So uh, in the methods are not that as transparent as we would need them to be to really be able to replicate the study um, oftentimes we have researchers that's not really based on a theory or where theories are very imprecise. Um, oftentimes we have very selective samples um, that are used to test specific theories. So in psychology, for example, there's a debate about using weird samples, which is an acronym that refers to Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic samples of participants. So. Um, and, and then the theories are tested with these very selective samples and people make general claims um, from their findings. But in the end, it's not clear whether these results can really be um, generalized to, to other publications or to a more general um, public. Um, of course, in the social sciences, we have to admit that many of our um, theories or of our, that many of our findings also are very dependent on specific contexts. And maybe also the context changes over time. So this might sometimes explain um, why things are not replicable, replicable anymore. Um, but oftentimes, this context dependency is not included in the theories as such. And of course, you have also cases of um, fraud um, that also, of course, uh, lead, lead to findings that are not replicable. Um, so um, there are many approaches that have emerged in social sciences, but in sciences in general, 
to um, find solutions to the replication crisis. So on the one hand, you have a broad open science movement that has sort of different components, but um, essentially aims at making the whole research process transparent and accessible to people um, through open data, um, open access approaches, and really to, to make everything very transparent so that people can really assess how the research was done. Um, then there's, there are large replication attempts, as I already mentioned before, that aim at really finding out how reliable um, our um, theories and our very famous findings in the different research domains are. Um, and one very important um, approach to tackle replication prices is pre-registration. So um, pre-registration um, is a very straightforward idea. I mean, it just means that um, you develop your research um, question um, and you base your hypothesis on the available theory, derive it from a theory, and you specify your study design, you specify exactly the analytic approach that you're going to take to test your hypothesis. And then you submit this pre-registration so you get a timestamp where your hypothesis and your methods are um, clearly laid down so people, so you can later then refer to this pre-registration when you submit your article to, to prove um, what your um, hypothesis was before you assessed your data or before you had access to data. And if in your article you have to deviate from your pre-registration, you can also make this transparent so you can really explain to people why you had to, to do something in a different way than you had said before. So this is also possible. So it is nothing that really that, that makes, you do not have to blindly follow everything that you pre-registered, but of course you have to make transparent the points where you don't follow your pre-registration. Um, there are some objections that you might think of that have also been brought forward against pre-registration. So first of all, it is hard to do, it is difficult. So this is something that no one would deny. So if you have already tried to pre-register your own research, you, you, you notice very quickly how difficult it is before having an idea about how the data look like to really specify all the details of, of your analytic approach and to be really specific about your prediction. So this is something that's not easy to do, but it's of course worth doing because I mean, that's what we would of course normally expect to really develop your hypothesis uh, very in, in, in very detail um, beforehand. So um, another objection is that it does not preclude publication bias. So of course it is possible for you to pre-register many different hypothesis and if your results turn out not supporting your hypothesis you just don't tell anybody about it so they could still end up in a file drawer um, on the other hand it does not necessarily preclude um, questionable research practices so um, for example there is a study that looked at pre-registered uh, pre-registrations pre um, of research and the articles that came out of it and still people do not necessarily report all the conditions that they pre-registered before in the article that in the end is published. So there is still some room um, for, for not mentioning everything that you had pre-registered before. Um, then, and this is also something that we are going to, to talk about today, um, pre-registration is not um, implemented equally easily in all research fields and with all different research approaches. So um, it is very easy to implement it in experimental research, in empirical confirmatory research, but in other research domains, such as qualitative research. And there are approaches trying to apply pre-registration in these fields, but it's, it's maybe not as straightforward as it is for, for experimental research. And then there's also an objection, which we are also going to address in the end again, um, which says that um, pre-registration creates a very strong focus on methodological aspects and maybe not does not look as much at theory development where maybe the real problem of the replication crisis lies. So, but we're going to come back to this um, objection later. So um, we think that some of these objections against pre-registration can be tackled by taking pre-registration um, to another level. 
Okay, so um, to extend the idea of pre-registration, and, and this is done in, in registered reports. So the basic idea of registered uh, reports is that you submit a scientific article, um, which is evaluated at a stage where both the, the authors and the reviewers are not aware of the results of the data that come out, out of it. So you write a research paper that includes the introduction and methods section, but does not include the results in the discussion. So you specify your research question, you um, develop an idea, uh, de 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 derive a hypothesis from, from theory, you specify this hypothesis, um, and then you specify in a very detailed way uh, your analytic strategy to test this specific hypothesis. And then this is submitted and the reviewers, they evaluate um, your submission based on the merits of your research idea, based on the plausibility of your hypothesis, and based on the appropriateness of your analytic approach that you suggest to, to use. And then at this, this is what happens at stage one of peer review. And what happens here is that if the, the, the reviewers agree that your idea makes sense and that your analytic approach is appropriate, then they can give you an in principle acceptance. So before even running the study, before collecting data, you know that irrespective of the results, um, this, is, this uh, paper is going to be published, okay? So once you have this in principle acceptance, you can normally start collecting data or you can start looking at data if you were talking about data that has already been collected. So then you start looking at data, you analyze data as you specified before, um, and then you write a regular article where, which includes the results section and where you discuss your findings. And then you submit this, um, this uh, manuscript again. This is at stage two peer review. So what happens here is essentially that reviewers just look at whether you really followed your um, plan that you specified it's at stage one. And then also they, evaluate your discussion um, as they would do in a normal regular uh, article. But then um, in the end, if, if everything is okay, so um, if you followed your, your pre-registered plan, um, the article is then really in fact published. So as you can see, some potential problems of like in the end, hiding um, pre-registrations or um, then not really reporting everything that was included in the pre-registration is really tackled in registered reports. And um, also your pre-registration in a registered report is much more detailed than it normally is with a normal pre-registration because you really write the article and really um, explain all your, all your, your approach and, and your hypothesis in more detail than you would normally do with a regular pre-registration. Okay. Um, so um, there is empirical um, research on whether um, registered reports are really successful in, in, in really bringing research out of the file drawer. And there is one study here by Scheel and colleagues um, where they compared um, a set of registered reports with a random sample of other articles. And um, you can see that the, at least the, the number of articles or the share of articles that do not support the hypothesis that they tested uh, is much higher at registered reports. So, I mean, of course, in this case, we have to keep in mind that the two, um, that the standard report and registered reports that were compared actually differed on many different uh, variables, but at least there's some indication that um, uh, registered reports are really um, successful in, yeah, also, bringing non-significant findings or findings that go against the hypothesis to the knowledge of uh, scientific community. So um, the idea behind the Glaze Open Science Challenge was to really um, advocate for this new publication format to, to let people know that it exists and to incentivize people to, to try out this new publication format and to make their experiences and to make, help it become more established in the field of political science and in the field of election research. So 
I'm going to continue and tell you something about how the Open Science Challenge worked and also some challenges that arose uh, during this Open Science Challenge and discuss these challenges with you. Um, yes, so the special thing about the Glass Open Science Challenge is that we combine the format of registered report with the field of uh, electoral research and secondary data. And first to answer the question, who is we? The GLES, the German Original Election Study. And uh, we are the central survey program in Germany for providing data on elections, on German elections. And there's one thing that makes GLES data suitable for registered reports, namely that data are freely um, accessible for or for the whole scientific community without signing any contract or something like this. So everyone can access our data and use it. Um, so for the Glass Open Science Challenge, we used um, two particular components of the Glass. Here you can see everything we've done during the election. And uh, for the Glass Open Science Challenge, we used the cross section that is um, our Harvey and Papi survey conducted right before the election. We only used the data that was collected before the election and um, a cross-sectional survey and also the rolling cross-section that is uh, a telephone survey that is conducted daily so that you can track uh, dynamics and changing during the electoral campaign. So these are the two data sets the Glass Open Challenge is based on. So what actually was the Glass Open Science Challenge? So what we did in this project is that we aligned our data collection and data publication processes with um, a review process of a scientific journal. So um, we have, you can see it here. This is the Glass Open Science Challenge. It's a special issue of a public opinion, sorry, <laughs> political science quarterly, uh, PVS. And uh, we aligned the review stages with the data collection stages. So um, first of all, before we started collecting data, we already published questionnaires and study description to researchers so that they, they get an attention of what is asked in the class and can set up their study design. And we released the questionnaire and the study description together with the core for papers uh, for an abstract for our special issue. So we aligned these two processes. After this, researchers had a short time, it was not very long, but they had time to uh, submit an abstract um, to us right before data collection started. And um, these abstracts were reviewed by the editorial team of the Glass Open Science Challenge at the time data collection started. And um, after yeah, some of these abstracts they got, they were recommended for submission of a stage one manuscript and others not. And we decided to implement this abstract submission stage because we want the burdens of submission to be low. Um, yes. So we received 32 abstracts and 17 abstracts were recommended for submission of a stage one manuscript. And um, during data collection of the GLASS data, uh, authors wrote their manuscripts and submitted them as a stage one manuscript. This is what Axel said. So this is a manuscript without looking at data. So a manuscript that has everything in it, the whole analysis plan and data analysis strategy, but not the research section. And researchers, they didn't know the, the uh, data because right now they're still collected. So after stage one manuscript, we also um, implemented again uh, editorial decision stage where we looked at the manuscripts because we had guidelines to, uh, the authors had to use and uh, really strict rules of how to set up the data analysis plan and what steps this uh, stage one manuscript should include. So we checked whether everything formal is correct in the stage manuscript. And then we sent it out to review. And um, for the review, we also published a call for reviewers because the whole process of 
review was aligned with the data collection and there was not much time for the review. So we needed to know before the review actually started whether reviewers would be able to review the article in this short time period. And um, yes, yeah, so all the manuscripts submitted as stage ice manuscript were formally correct and entered the review process. And at this time, data collection was finished and data was proceeded and cleaned by our data managers. So um, after this review, this review was two rounds. So yes, a two round review. Um, some of the articles from the review uh, got a in pr principle acceptance. This is also what Axel mentioned earlier. This is, you know, your manuscript will be um, published in the journal, regardless of the outcomes of your analysis. Um, so at the time of the in principle acceptance, or we sent out the in principle acceptance right before data was published. Okay, and um, after this first stage, special stage one review process, we just uh, started this, uh, others needed to submit their stage two manuscripts. And after this, this was comparable to a normal review process of a normal journal paper. So they submitted their stage two manuscripts and they were sent out to review again. Um, but all the stage two manuscripts were also published at the end of the Glass Open Science Challenge. Okay, so um, this was the schedule, but as I already mentioned, there were some challenges. So the first challenge we had to face was bringing together registered reports with electoral research and um, because there's a dilemma and we call it flexibility versus rigidity um, because electoral research is a kind of research where you have to be flexible because there's so much going on during the electoral campaign. You don't know what happened right before. And sometimes it's necessary to adjust your data analysis strategy to these developments outside your data in the real world. And um, this is something that's hard to implement in, reg in registered report or pre-registration because especially in our approach, um, stage one manuscripts had to be submitted before the outcome of the election was actually known. So nobody knows what, what happened, but the data analysis has to be planned right um, so this is some, yeah, paradox, <laughs> and it needs to be resolved somehow. And it wasn't able to resolve, we weren't able to resolve it during the Glass Open Science Challenge, but maybe for future projects using secondary data for um, pre-registration may be a good way not in a challenge, but generally because the data are there and you can access them later, but already know what happened during the electoral campaign because the data already has been collected. Um, but if you use the format of register report with secondary data, there are some new issues arising. Um, namely, um, the question whether um, researchers already have accessed your data. So in the case of GLASS, it's so that the data is freely accessible to everyone and you can pre-register something with GLASS data, but right now, if you want to pre-register your study with GLASS data right now, nobody knows whether you have accessed the data right before your pre-registration or not. So this is a big challenge and this is also something we want to discuss with you because it's a big issue for registered reports with secondary data. What do you think? Do you think it's enough if researchers self-certify that they didn't have access to the data right before they purchased their study? Or do you maybe think it's better if you restrict access to data sets and make them not public, available to everyone? Um, but make put some contracts on it so that you can only can download it with a certificate that you downloaded the data right now. Do you have any opinions about that? Dennis. 
I would say that unless you design a pre-registration or registered report process the same way you did, such that it's physically impossible to download the data before you uh, submit your stage one manuscript because the data isn't released at all, the rest isn't really credible. Because even if you provide the download with a certificate, you could still have a third party download the data before. Have them pass the data onto you, even in violation of a contract uh, or data use agreement, and still base your pre-registration on that. So I think regardless of whether you make the data freely available or whether you restrict it uh, on a user by user basis, there's always this doubt that the person might have used the data before. And this will then devalue the added benefit of pre-registration. So I, I would say, I think what you did was actually the best practice in the sense that you fielded a, a call for registered reports on a timeline that made it impossible for anybody to view the data before they submitted their hypothesis. But so you would say one should not use registered report for secondary data if the, the data usage is not physically um, yeah. unavoidable, yeah. I mean, you can, but then the question always is, how credible is it and does it really add value to the credibility of the research? I mean, and one thing that, I mean, I, th I think you're right, but uh, you can also see the drawbacks of that because I mean, if you look at the, the papers that got published in the end in the, in the, in the um, open science uh, registration challenge, then you see that there is no paper, for example, referring specific to this specific election. So we have many papers like dealing with a decision-making processes in the context of, of voting decisions in a general way um, or some specific topics that were tested with this data, these data sets. But um, I think it would have been, or a person would have had to be very lucky to, to really identify something, uh, for example, an event that happened during election campaign and that the person thinks this might have been relevant for voting decisions and then be able to submit a paper on this event. So this would be almost impossible. So, I mean, there are parts relevant to electoral research that we lose maybe having such a, such a strict criteria. So, I mean, these people, they would have to use secondary data afterwards, probably. So it would, they would have to be very lucky to, to be able to participate in the, in the challenge with such a research question. I'm also, I also I agree with you. I think uh, I, I think the way you did it or best is uh, is, a, is a better way, the best way. And I also think that the flexibility versus rigidity paradox is not that bad because I think you you rather should have to find a way how to deal with it in the uh, pre-registration and in the discussion. So how to because. In the end, you want to test general theories, so they should also be robust to certain events, theoretically. So there should be rather a way to how you uh, would deal with it in the pre-registration and in the discussion, I guess. That's a better way. And I, I think data should be as pretty accessible as possible. So I think to, to restrict access is, is, wouldn't be the sort of solution. Also for the race in the beginning, um, it should be easy. Um, I would argue to um, um, be involved. I mean, to, to use this kind of registered reports or pre-registration and to promote that also in the in the academic community. And so I would argue for the the trust route actually to kind of I mean, as you said, also like make this available. And I mean, and, and as Dennis said, right, you can't really prevent other misuse of. Um, of, of, of that. So I would, I would be also more in favor of this trust based approach. I, I have a question. Do you know uh, how prevalent or how often this, uh, these reports are used in natural science? Because they are, you also could do the experiment and then uh, give the pre uh, uh, pre afterwards. Because I don't know, not every experiment is very expensive, right? So uh, it it's also, would also be a question how they deal with it. 
there in experimental studies? Yeah, I'm not sure to, to be honest how they handle it, like in, in physics or, or in other natural but, sciences. Yeah, but later on, we come to a relatively new approach uh, that comes from physics. So maybe this is something we can discuss later. Okay, so thank you. Um, maybe some of you know Chris Chambers, a master of registered reports, and he developed kind of a um, model how to distinguish between different steps of data access for um, using registered report for secondary data that all go ahead with a risk of bias due to prior data access. And maybe this is something that could be implemented, but so bias is the lowest if, if data is just accessible and the, um, the risk of bias rises when data have been accessed or others have been looked at the data right before or also did some, some analysis with the data. But I think also this model depends on trust that everyone's transparent in whether they access the data and, and how they, uh, what they did with the data. Okay, so uh, during conducting the OSC, another challenge arose, and uh, this challenge is more a practical challenge we had in this uh, in the OSC, namely um, a lack of diversity of the participating authors. Um, so if we look at the people who participated in the OSC, we see that. These researchers were mainly male, and most of them came from Germany, and also the majority of them were from the University of Mannheim, so this is a large bias. And um, we tried to be critical with ourselves in conducting this challenge and thought about possible measures we could have taken to avoid this bias and to encourage female researchers and researchers from outside this glass bubble to participate in our challenge. And yeah, we think maybe this is because of the data we used, because GLASS is um, a data set that comes from the University of Mannheim and is used here for um, in, the, in the study and um, Many researchers from the University of Manam are familiar with the data set of the GLASS data, and this is not the case for other universities, maybe. Um, but yeah, maybe we should have, or sure, we should have done more to encourage researchers to participate in our uh, challenge. And this is also something we want to discuss with you. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions what we could have done to encourage researchers or should should do if we want to do something like the open science challenge again to prevent um, this kind of publication bias. So I have a suggestion and a question. I'll start with a question. Um, could you maybe go back to the previous slide? Uh, it seems that the biggest drop in uh, female authorship occurs after the abstract submission. Could you maybe give us some insights on, like, was this simply a result of quality control, or how comes that that uh, women disproportionately dropped out of the process at this stage? Um, well, we're not sure. There was, on the one hand, there were many uh, abstracts submitted, and the authors did not submit a stage one manuscript anymore, although they were encouraged to submit a stage one manuscript. So this is one dropout. Um, process that could explain this gap. Um, and the other one is, I don't know. <laughs> I think maybe we would have to really check um, what was the, the encouragement they received at this stage um, and then look at um, whether they submitted or not, depending on, on gender. So, I mean, it might be the case. I'm not sure if this is the case. So that that the male participants, even not having been encouraged, end up sending in a complete manuscript while female do not. But um, we would have to, to this would be something interesting to look at, I think. Yeah. I mean, because that would be one suggestion, right? That maybe a, a 
implicit um, subconscious biases somehow played into this decision even at this early stage. So, um, but I think the other problem, and it's a more structural one, um, I think the gender balance that we see here and also the institutional um, affiliation balance that we see here is fairly representative of electoral research in Germany. I mean, if you go to Akavaden, you see a lot of men and you see a lot of people from Mannheim with maybe a little Constance and Frankfurt and, um, and VZB in there. So um, I think with a different topic um, where you have a more diverse community to begin with, your chances of having a more diverse group of authors um, would be higher from the beginning. Um, I, I think this is a structural problem in electoral research in Germany, which needs to be solved, but I don't think that you, as uh, the, the conveners of a registered, or special issue and registered report alone, can solve this problem. Yeah, uh, we also thought about possible steps we could include and looked at the literature and what they say, how to increase uh, diversity in research project. And we try to find solution for every drop out at every step of submission to the Open Science Challenge. So at the beginning, maybe we should have actively recruited a diverse range of people and not only using the standard mailing lists we used to share our call of papers, but also actively go to people outside from that list. And also one thing is that we could have claimed diversity to be a central goal of conducting this open science challenge, but we didn't do. Um, there are other issues. For example, you could have a look that your editorial board is also diverse and also your review board is diverse. And this is something you said, broaden the scope of the journal. So it be, would have been open to other ideas maybe that would have an impact. And um, also for the stage one manuscript, uh, there's something from this article that claims that, for example, men, uh, if they are white men, if they conclude on the research, they're more confident in, in showing what they found out than women. And this maybe we could have resolved by actively encouraging female researchers not to be shy in, in presenting their results and be more confident. What we could also have done is giving workshops on glass data so that everyone is familiar with the data set outside this white male uh, University of Mannheim bubble and invite researchers actively to, to meetings to encourage them to participate. And there's another issue that was lost in an article that if dropout happens here, this may be due to an inner circle of people or authors that correspond with editors and are friends with them. And these are mostly kind of male circles. I think that this <clears throat> does not meet our open science challenge. I think we were not, I'm not aware that we had some kind of inner circle here, but maybe for future projects. Okay, so after going into the specifics of the Open Science Challenge, we want to broaden the scope up again and discuss about which repository. Um, yes, there's one um, issue that, that you can find in the literature that is sometimes brought up um, as a point of critique against pre-registration and registered reports that is also relevant, I think, in the context of the Glaze Open Science Challenge. And um, basically um, what these researchers argue is, is that um, the real problem of the um, reproducibility crisis is maybe not um, to, to be looked at on the side of methods, but lies in theory, in the specification of theories that we have um, theories that are not specific enough, that are vague, and, and therefore um, findings are not um, um, replicated in replication studies. Yeah, so what they basically say is that um, pre-registration therefore misses the, the crucial point um, of the replication crisis because um, what pre-registration does is to force people to be very specific about their methods, to specify their analytic approach. Um, but 
in the end, these specifications, they do not follow from theory. So in the end, if uh, a hypothesis is not supported, then um, it does not bother the theory as much because um, the how the specific study was run was not derived from theory as such. And still the defenders of the theory can come up with uh, reasons why the specific study uh, didn't show the effect. Um, and then still the theory remains as it is. So I brought you here a quote from a paper by Zalozzi and Duncan that maybe um, shows how this line of reasoning goes. So I'm going to just read it out to you. Um, methods based on the exploratory confirmatory distinction allow researchers to temporarily fix the predictions of their theories. This usually takes the form of choosing a set of predictions out of the many possible ones consistent with the theory and stating that these are what the researchers expect. Methods oriented solutions focus on inflexibility where it does not matter, but not where it does. Scientists can get batches as long as the predictions of their theory were temporarily fixed, but hardly anyone cares if the theory would have easily accommodated the opposite predictions. We should be placing greater emphasis on exploring other avenues and um, particularly non-empirical ways of reducing theory flexibility. So this is like, they say that in the end, all these pre-registration attempts, they just, just miss the point because in the end, it's all about more, more specific, less flexible theory. So um, does this make sense to you? What, what do you think about it? Because I mean, this is something that I would have to say from the experience, how we handled papers in the open science challenge this is something that happens easily. So you see that the authors are not as clear about their analytic approach as you would expect them to be. So you force them to be more specific, to specify the covariates and stuff, but um, you do not always care whether this, this specific covariates that they specify, if they derive this from a theory or if they just end up making some specifications um, and then you accept it as the they, they are, it's just a rule of the game that they are following. So um, I don't know. So if you think that there is something to to this point, or um, yeah, what, what do you what do you think? Is this, is this really a problem? How would you respond to this criticism from a replication perspective? Yeah. yeah, I think maybe this only means that you need separate a separate kind of literature where the theory is like developed and where you like more precisely define what the theory is, and then you have a registered reports which test the theory. So perhaps you should separate those two things more, because I, I think also a lot of papers do the, at the same time develop a theory and test it, and maybe that's not the best way. To do it, so, yes. so maybe I, I think I, I think they are right. I think it's like it's not the solution. The prerequisites of that reports are not the solution for bad theories. I think this is super interesting because my uh, my criticism was always the other way around, um, as you know, because it made it into the special issue conclusion. Um, but my concern was always that pre-registration and registered uh, reports in particular focus very much on the hypotheses with and not the findings. So the hypothesis and the credibility of the test that you propose a priori, but it doesn't really open a door for the value of exploratory research. That is perhaps theory blind or maybe theory driven, but not so much into confirmatory testing of prior expectations at the, uh, at the outset. So. Um, I always thought it's a tool that fixes one thing, namely that you formulate um, hypotheses after seeing the results in line with the results that you've already found, but that it cannot accommodate the value of research that is theory driven in the sense that it adopts certain perspectives on a phenomenon, but then really tries to crawl the data and deeply engage with the data to see 
a universe of potential findings that you could get out of this. And we, like the last talk in the social science data lab was uh, by Reinhard Schunk on multiverse analysis, which is then one tool to aggregate this richness of possible results that you can massage out of one and the same data, and then use that for future theory development. So my concern was always quite in the opposite direction. And I think what we really need is maybe be more specific with what the primary goal of research is. Is it the deduction and development of theoretical hypotheses? Is it the testing, confirmatory testing of deductively derived hypotheses in which case I think pre-registration and registered report are the best tool available? Or is it data-driven exploration with the goal of producing new insights and then perhaps building up on that new theories, in which case I think we need different tools and pre-registration is not the best tool we have available. And what, what we also saw in, in the Open Science Challenge, that I mean, it is really a continuum of, of like research that, that has a very, very specific hypothesis and focuses on this one and research that is just or is mainly interested in finding out correlations of one specific construct with several different constructs. And then they formulate hypotheses about these relations, but it is exploratory in a sense because it is broad and it has several different correlations. So we had a, a, a spectrum of, of research also included in, in the Open Science Challenge um, where um, you then really have also a problem about how, how do you deal with a paper that has 12 different hypotheses and stuff. This was an issue that, that came up during the, the editorial process uh, for us. Um, so um, yeah, it, I, this is really an interesting topic to look at uh, how can you make possible exploratory research? Is, is our registered report the, the right framework for, for exploratory research or, or um, do we then have to, to distinguish about it? between research that is really appropriate for this format and research that's not that appropriate for that format. Um, that's, um, yeah, I think a very relevant discussion. Yeah. Well, I think another issue maybe is that if you're using theories or develop theories and um, formulate your hypothesis out of these theories, these theories mostly are really broad and unspecific and so this is really, I think, that depends on the researcher how how he ends up with formulating hypothesis out of this broad, unclear theory. And I think this is something like a degree of freedom that every researcher has. And maybe this is kind of a problem in research generally that leads to this, um, also leads to replication crisis because everyone understands theory in a different kind of way. and. Uh, and this is something that is not addressed by registered reports, but I think an important step is to make everything explicit. And I think this is something registered reports help. So you make every decision you make, you have to make explicit and explain. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, I think, difficult. Like, like this perspective suggests that you could derive all the specifications of your analysis plan from theory directly. But I mean, that's not the aim of a theory to be that specific, really I tell you about all the operationalizations and stuff. So, I mean, there's still always room for, for, for uh, where researchers have to define the operationalizations and they have to define the exclusion criteria for, for their sample. And this is not going to come from theory. So they have to make a decision. And, and as we all know, I mean, there are several possible decisions that are, okay but but still do you have to make a decision so i mean um still by forcing people to be specific about their approach and their pre-registration you really um tackle the problem of reducing um the researcher degrees of freedom and really um making this more reliable what what happens here and you avoid the hiking problem for people to to in the end saying that they had planned to run the study as they did in the end, but in, in, in reality, they, they did it in a way that gave them the, the, the significant uh, finding that they wanted. Yeah, I, I would just like to add, I think what you just said about the, the challenges that come with that, that theory doesn't dictate all aspects of your analysis plan. That's even more true if you're not in charge of the data collection and you're using observational research. So if you're collecting your own data for a survey experiment, you can use quota sampling and ensure that treatment and control groups are balanced within different strata of the data. 
but with a project like like the glass open science challenge you can propose certain moderators and or treatment uh, variables and you will never know if your your specification may be terribly underpowered because you are not in control of the type of data you get so that makes it even harder yeah. i mean what this perspective does is really to to raise the point that i mean it's not i mean methodological approaches are not going to solve everything and and also the the specification of theories is part of the problem of the of the is part of the replication crisis so um this is certainly uh, something that that is important to, to keep in mind okay so hand over to you for the next week so at this end we want to uh, introduce another approach and um, that may help to um to increase the reliability of our findings. And this is not as common in social sciences as uh, pre-registration and registered report, but maybe it would help for you, Dennis, as you said, if you use data like the GLASS data, you don't know what kind of data you will have, and maybe your model is underpowered or something like this. And maybe here, uh, blinded analysis is the way to do it. And um, this kind of research method was developed in physics. And um, here the idea is that um, data analysts or researchers who analyze the data are blinded towards the outcome of the data. So not all data, so they have access to the data, but kind of the data like the key variables or group identities, if you want to investigate differences between groups. Um, are blinded or in an experiment that would be or would mean that not also the um, participants in the experiments and not only the experimental leader, but also the data analyst is blinded. So he don't know who got the treatment and who did not get the treatment. And this maybe help um, biases uh, to minimize biases in data analysis, but um, allows more flexibility because you know the structure of your data and uh, you know the power, uh, the power, yes. And um, to illustrate how this approach works, we have a small comic or cartoon example. And in this case, we have here this researcher. I don't know, I think he's a biologist or something like this. And he has a hypothesis on the number of Facebook friends that should be correlated with the size of amygdala or something like this. I think this is something in your brain. And uh, he has the hypothesis, and so he starts to collect data uh, from brains and also collect data on Facebook friends. And afterwards, before, after he collected data, the data is blind. And so there are different approaches how he could blind data. For example, you could add noise to, to variables, or you could just um, use simulation data and yeah, different approaches. So then the data is blinded. And afterwards, the experimenters gives the data to a data analyst, and the data analyst only gets this um, blind data, uh, and then he can start setting up his research plan and data analysis strategy, knowing the standard deviation of the variables he uses and other, other things, but not the actual outcome. And after he finished his data analysis plan, he hands over his analysis plan back to the experimental leader. And then, ta-da, the data is unblinded again, and uh, you get your results. So maybe this is an approach that may be suitable also in the social scientists and solve some of the issues, uh, registered reports, or also pre-registration has. Yeah. So um, one, one question you might have is, okay, that such an a open science challenge as we presented here is, is something nice to have. It is incentivizes people uh, to participate. It gives you certain deadlines that might motivate people to, to hand in their manuscripts in time and, and stuff like that and um, recruits, uh, reviewers as we did beforehand. Um, but of course, I mean, um, Registered reports um, are being more and more accepted in different fields. Um, and there are more and more journals um, accepting this uh, publication format. So for example, 
just two examples in, in, in political science, you might want to look at the Journal of Experimental Political Science that now accepts um, registered reports or the Journal of Politics that had a pilot project now um, where they tried or looked at how it works to implement um, registered reports as a publication format, but there are also other journals in political science and uh, in other disciplines that are now open to, to this uh, publication format. And there is also um, a project that is very interesting to look at um, that aims at creating um, peer communities in different uh, fields of science that um, handle the publication process and the review process. So um, they create um, communities where authors hand in a manuscript that is stored in a repository. Um, there are um, recommenders that would be the, the handling editors in, in a regular journal um, who invite uh, reviewers for, for these um, reprints that are stored in a repository. And then um, there are different versions of, of the paper that come out of the uh, review process. And in the end, um, they, if the article is, is recommended for publication, then uh, authors can still decide if they want to um, just keep it with this recommendation on the repository or if they want to publish it in this project's own journal or if they want to publish it in, in a journal that really accepts this recommendation already and does the paper does not enter a new uh, a review process or um, if they want to submit it to a regular journal. Um, and there is a specific, I mean, there are communities for different um, topics and there is a specific one for registered reports. So this is something very interesting to look at and you can find many examples of registered reports from different fields um, that have been submitted and recommended to this uh, project here. So um, this is certainly something that you will and hopefully hear more and more about. Um, and if you're not, if you've not work with registered reports, so um, there are some obstacles, it is not easy to do, but um, I think this is for, for science, um, very, very, a very promising approach to take. And, and we would very much encourage uh, people to try out this publication format. Okay, thank you very much. We have no time for questions. Um, many survey programs have like uh, innovation panels or, or stuff like that. For example, the um, Understanding Society uh, or the, has like an innovation module where you can hand in experiments and also Gizos has a Gizos panel, for example. So those would be the perfect places to make such pre registered re reports, right? Because you have, they have access to uh, the samples and you can hand in an experiment which has never been done before. So maybe that would be a way to go forward to, to uh, cooperate with those institutions and to really, so that, that like handing in an experiment there uh, also means to pre-register pre uh, like, no, late, late, and later article, and to really say before him what what you wanted to study, and then to yeah to check whether the the expected results um, came out. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point because really um, working with this innovation modules of these established survey programs um, gives you then certain deadlines and predefined um, dates where where you know data is going to be published, so you can really um, use this for, for, for planning your, your pre-registration and everything. You actually do something like pre-registration anyway, because you have to hand in everything before. So, but, but I think it's not like uh, in the publication phase, it's not dealt with anymore, what they mm -hmm. handed in before. Yeah, but I think maybe that's, some, um, that's a thing where also infrastructure projects like the GLASS should we come active and say, okay, if you want to run your study within our panel, then you need to pre-register it. Maybe this would help. I'm curious about your experience with journals, actually, with that. So, uh, on one hand, with the British uh, Village like, did, um, have they already published registered reports before your challenge, or were they, I guess they were quite keen to, to do that? 
Uh, yes, it was the first time Rochester report were published at PPRS. And unfortunately, as it looks like now, also the last time, I think they they didn't want to include it as a standard publication format because it's a lot of extra work for editors. You have to check all the code and um, the stage one manuscripts. You need to formally check these manuscripts and there's a lot of additional work. And we did this in this uh, Glass Open Science Challenge for the PVS, but they said they, they can't do it in their normal editorial process. Yeah, I mean, we were, we were lucky to work with them because they were really open to, to try it out and they were very supportive also in the whole uh, editorial process. They were very involved. They, they, they knew all the papers also in detail and, and, and gave us feedback on them. Um, so this was a very good uh, experience and very nice to work with them. But uh, as Hannah said, so I mean, um, it is uh, different from regular uh, formats and, and more work, I think. So yeah. There was also the issue with the editorial manager. They use the editorial manager and there's not a button you can click for IPA. So <laughs> I think others, they gained a, I don't know, except, no, you didn't get an accept. I think, I don't know how we implemented this, but this is also an issue. I think all these ma editorial managers are often not suitable for this format. I think it was just major, yeah. but I mean, <laughs> it, it got the point across. Keep working on this. I mean, it's worth mentioning also that for data providers, it's also challenging because for us, what was new, I mean, is that um, normally, for example, in the rolling cross section study, which is aimed at, at capturing campaign dynamics, so we are able to include new questions in the questionnaire when certain topics come up during the election campaign. And also, um, to be honest, like, um, we are not normally not ready with the questionnaire that early um, on. So, so normally, and, and it was the case that we had some, some placeholders in the questionnaire. So, so there were some things that were added to the questionnaire during the campaign. So we tried to make that transparent as early as possible. So when there were new questions, we published a new questionnaire. Um, but still there were some placeholders and there were some variables that people were not able to work with that we only published in the end. So um, I think this was a good compromise with, that we found, but it was like for us also some pressure to, to really have the, the questionnaires ready on time for, for, for the Glaze Open Science Challenge. Yeah. What a very impressive um, schedule that you had, for sure. I mean, you had the election, the document for it, right? and then and the, uh, like the parallel of the submission process and all these different steps. Yeah, it was uh, it was really hard um, to handle these deadlines because there were really hard deadlines and also for the reviewers and for us and for the authors. So I think it was a lot of work for everyone. But on the other hand, it was really a fast track publication. I think it was more or less a year after submitting an abstract when the article became published. So I think it's worth it. I would like to know your thoughts on, um, well, on, on something that, that builds up on the discussions we've had here today. Um, because like in my head, pre-registration or register reports can fix two things at once. The one thing is, you really want to ensure that people don't, um, I think harking was the word, right? Uh, adjust their hypotheses to the results that they find. Um, so ensure that confirmatory research is in fact confirmatory and not exploratory research passed off as confirmatory. Um, the other thing is that people really commit to a pre-analysis plan from which they minimally or not at all deviate uh, to ensure that you do not selectively report the most spectacular findings. And I think this is something that applies to both conformatory and more exploratory research alike. Um, so even if you are free of any hypotheses and you do not strive to test the theory and you just want to produce knowledge on a phenomenon as an exploratory research, you can still selectively focus on the most spectacular specification out of a universe of potential specifications. Um, and I kind of wonder, so at the same time, there's a trade-off, right? Because certain choices are probably best made about, let's say, how to 
spin or categorize variables or things related to power after having seen the data, because otherwise you may end up with nonsensical statistical specifications. And I think my question is, um, so I have very little doubt that pre-registration is an optimal tool for doing the first thing, so preventing harking, but with respect to the second, so guiding people to stay away from reporting, selective reporting of the most spectacular findings, I wonder if it's really optimal there, um, especially because I think the research process in and of itself is somewhat evolutionary, and you may come up with better ideas as you go, also in exchange with reviewers. So I was wondering, could you think, or are you aware of any other formats that are a bit more flexible and interactive and allow you to cumulatively ensure that you do not selectively report, but at the same time allow you to improve your specification as the research process unfolds? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think there is still, I mean, room for, for how, how strictly people expect people to stick to their specifications when they, in the end, write the, 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 the stage two manuscript. So, I mean, something that I would like, find interesting to, to well, where I would accept flexibility is that, I mean, maybe there is also a point to, to, um, to emphasize certain findings in the end more than others if you're still reporting everything you did. So, I mean, in, in terms of storytelling and for people later to, to, to have a more readable article, so maybe it's not necessarily bad to, to maybe shift your, your emphasis, emphasis a bit after you know the, the, the findings. So, but I, I, I mean, there is, uh, I mean, of course you should still report everything you, you did um, and 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 I think what what always happens is that people, um, in the end, when they see the data, they they come up with new uh, covariates or, or something that they think, okay, I should have specified this in a different way at the, the pre-registration. So, um, and then in the end, they they I mean they have to be transparent about it and and, and write what they do in a different way than was specified before. Um, but I don't. I'm not. Not sure. At least I'm not aware of completely different formats that would give people more flexibility. I mean, what what you mentioned. I mean, the the, the blinded analysis. I mean, this would give you more possibilities to to adapt your analysis to um, issues that come up when you look at the data structure, without um, being the person who formulated the hypothesis. Um, but I'm not I'm not aware of, of other completely different formats. But I think the point you raised is really interesting. This was something we discussed very often. So where is the boundary because exploratory research and deductive research? Because there were some cases where people came up with new ideas how to analyze data after they've seen the results. And I, I don't know if we agree on something, but in my opinion, it's not really explorative research because if you hadn't got the results from your first analysis in the first step, you wouldn't have come with the idea of what variables to add or what, what other analysis to conduct. So it's kind of, yeah, it's based on the results from your, from your pre-registered study. And I think this is something we, or yeah, we just got to know that this is really a sparse um, distinction as, we, as we've seen it in the registered reports uh, they, that were um, submitted before we never thought about this, I think. And I think this is something what, what's really a good at registered reports, right? That you have really to be explicit. Question about this blinded analysis that you introduced that was very interesting. Um, how is that into your, um, how is that implemented in, in physics? Like, I mean, how um, who is kind of making uh, like adding noise to the data? Is it the data producer? And then, um, um, yeah, I think the one really important criterion in this uh, approach is that you have kind of a data manager and a data analysis. So you need two separate persons and one that blinds the data and one that analyzes the data. 
and this approach came up in the 1950s and um, because the physics was in a kind of a crisis because all the new experiments they conducted they just replicated the results from previous um, studies so it was not replication studies but the results were always the same and then I don't know the name of this guy but he came up with this idea that also the data analyst should be should be blinded so it's really on the author side two two separate people who are having a look yeah so you so need yeah. just on a different aspect of the yeah so you need you always this i think this is when the one crucial point about it, you always need this person who's called data manager or something like this uh, who blinds the data Okay. Thank you. Again, so thank Anna. you for your questions. Um, this was actually the last event of the Social Science Data Lab in the spring semester, 2023. I want to thank you again and all the speakers who contributed to our event uh, series in this semester. And the Data Lab will be back um, in the fall, and we'll, we're happy to soon um, publish the schedule. So stay tuned.